Okay, um, I'm going to talk about phonon nuclear coupling matrix element for channel 181. Um, so we've been interested in developing basic physics models for the anomalies. Um, in my view, there's, there's two basic problems to be dealt with. How do you couple between the microscopic and the macroscopic? How, do you, how does the lattice talk to internal nuclear states? This is not an easy thing to do. And the other is how do you up convert or down convert energy? Because I think that's the only reasonable solution to um, the problem of absence of energetic nuclear radiation. So I want to start out with a phonon nuclear interaction. I've spoken about this before. Uh, <laughs> I, I got carried away with my slides. Uh. <laughs> so if we start out with a relativistic model, I, um, although this is a theory talk, uh, uh, I'll only have my worst equations at the beginning. So if we have a relativistic model, we treat uh, nucleons as uh, direct particles, and for simplicity, we do a two-body interaction, although nuclear inter interactions are three-body and four-body as well. And we do an elegant and even beautiful <coughs> rotation. Then we can uh, simplify, although this doesn't look like it's simplified, it, it, is, it is reduced some. We have um, basically a non-relativistic uh, particle interacting with fields. We have relativistic internal structure. Uh, we have coupling with the, uh, uh, the external fields to internal states. And then we have this extra stuff which is uh, relativistic, uh, basically corrections uh, to boosts of the field. Um, so this business here is in a sense new. It's coupling between center of mass uh, degrees of freedom and internal nuclear degrees of freedom. If we eliminate the external fields just to make our life simpler, then the Hamiltonian from before gives us a particle kinetic energy. It gives us an internal nuclear structure problem, but it gives us a coupling between the center of mass and the internal nuclear coordinates. And I've been, uh, I'm thinking that this is the interaction that's involved in our field where um, if a nucleus is vibrating, the vibrations can couple to the internal nuclear states and, and maybe do stuff for us. Okay, so I'm thinking about the result. Um, this comes out directly from direct phenomenology for protons and neutrons. The basic effect was actually discovered by Bright back in 1937 or so. Um, the dominant couplings from the boost of the nucleon-nucleon interaction, but I want to get some intuition about it. So, um, and again, ap apologies for some messy equations that are going to fill up the board, but if we consider the case of um, Coulomb plus Bright interaction in the rest frame for relativistic problem, it would look like this. If we were to boost it, we we would basically boost sort of like this. We would get a complicated mess. If we separated the complicated mess out, we have what we have in the rest frame, and then we have a correction due to the uh, boost. We can compare this with the uh, commutator relationship we got from the foldy Woltusen, and that evaluates in this particular case to this. So if I compare this guy to this guy, they look a lot alike. The only difference is that there's some beta operators showing up, and if it's close to non-relativistic, beta operators are basically one. So basically what we find out is that this um, commutator that we've worked out from the foldy Woltusen relation, which I'm looking at as being the reaction, is nothing more or less to say that when you move the nucleus, that if the interaction is velocity dependent, well, if you change the velocity, then the interaction is different. And, and this example was done by a number of authors in the literature, and I'm repeating it, but the argument's basically well known. So things begin to become clear. Um, the coupling term, the linear, the, this phonon nuclear coupling term, it's just fixing the magnetic interaction in the simple example. Um, and it fixes the nuclear interaction when the systems boost. Now, in, in 
free space if you're in, in vacuum and you're just moving straight, then if you go into the frame of the motion, then what the boost does is makes everything be right in the frame of motion. But on the other hand, if you're moving back and forth, then you have to be right going this way, you have to be right going that way. So um, y you actually have a real life coupling that you can't rotate out uh, uh, simply. Anyway, given this interaction, Talon 181 is important. Uh, let me, in, in my models, I, I'm interested in excitation from ground states to low-lying uh, nuclear states, basically because the lower the energy is, the bigger an effect you can get in the models. So here are the, some of the lowest uh, nuclear excited states. Uh, Mercury 201 is the lowest of them. Um, Tantalum 181 is the second lowest and so forth. But what we see is that this multipolarity is E1, which basically is electric dipole mul multipolarity. Uh, all the others aren't. And the interaction that we're dealing with is electric dipole multipolarity. So this transition is basically the one which is special in uh, this theory. If I look at the lowest energy E1 transitions for stable nuclei, here they are. Um, Tantalum's basically singular in all of this. Um, uh, and, and so that's why my interest is focused on it in this talk and hopefully in upcoming experiments. Uh, okay, so we've seen that. So the nuclear states. Um, so some nuclei are spherical, some are deformed, and some look like footballs, and some look like... Uh, basketballs that you sat on. Um, what about Talon 181? Well, Talon 181 is a prolate spheroidal. Um, in the early literature, uh, basically 1950s, 1960s, Talon 181 figured as a key participant in the deformed nuclear models that were under consideration at the time. Um, there's a parameterization of the nuclear surface that was adopted for these studies. Um, and the way it worked is that if you have an odd mass nucleus, so Talon 181 uh, has uh, 73 protons and 100 and some odd uh, neutrons, but it's got an odd number of protons, uh, the way these odd, nuclei, uh, odd mass nuclei were understood is that the outer odd nucleon, be it a proton or neutron, would act like a single particle in a deformed well. And so here's an example of uh, Hamiltonian people were, used to work with it. Kinetic energy, deformed nuclear potential, uh, Coulomb potential where the charge is assumed to be uniformly distributed over the um, shape of the nucleus, and then a spin orbit interaction to correspond with the observed splitting. So this model was very successful. This and associated things with it won some of the physicists a Nobel Prize in 1975. Uh, Nielsen and some of the others uh, were, were cited for this. Um, so the model's a straightforward model. It's, it's the simplest that could possibly be relevant. It's been well studied. It's closely related to the spherical models. It's philosophically consistent with an electron orbital in an atom kind of model. By now, the deformation models are readily available. We can do the de deformed Coulomb interaction. The spin-orbit interaction has been parameterized. So we've got everything we need to do a calculation. Um, the nuclear potential um, for a, a spherical model would be used the Wood-Saxon's potential. It looks like this. Uh, for the Neutrons, it's not so deep. For the protons, a little bit deeper. It goes out six to eight fermis or so. Um, in the case of Talon 181, if you plug in the numbers from the optimization, the deformed potential in a cross-section looks a little bit like this. It's kind of like a weird, weird-shaped football. Um, to solve the models, uh, as it turns out, you don't actually have to do all of this. You can download a code that will calculate the energy levels for you. It's the AAXX code of Dudek and his collaborators uh, who did a really good job. In fact, I was able to download the code and get it to run. 
Um, unfortunately, I, I have a philosophical difficulty about using other people's code, so I kind of like, if I do it myself, I know it's in the code. If I use somebody else's code, I, who knows what's in it. So um, I adopted a couple channel approach, mostly because I had this really bright brainstorm about how to get couple channel approaches to work really fast. That ended up failing, but I decided to finish the code anyway, and I used the answers from the code. Um, with no spin orbit interaction, each channel looks something like this. It's pretty standard in these quantum calculations. Um, for a spherical problem, I tested it. This is what Dudix code does. This is the best version of my code. So for the 1S state, the answer looks good. For the 3S state, the answer looks good. And in between, the answers look good. So my code basically works. I did a deformed problem. And once again, you can check this column against this column. The two codes look good. I'm getting good answers. Uh, more deformed problems with more angular momentum channels in larger space, and that looks good. Uh, for the spin orbit interaction, uh, the dominant part is basically empirical. Uh, people model it like this. Um, we have to work out the matrix elements and implement it in a couple channel code. We can do that. Uh, as it turns out, there's a gazillion terms. I found that only keeping part of the spin orbit basically got pretty good answers and it ran much faster and was less work, so I, I was lazy. Uh, for the spherical problem, including spin orbit, I basically get really good answers. For the deformed problem, the answers aren't quite as good. There's a little bit of difference now, but the difference is small enough that I'm probably going to get an okay answer for my matrix element that I care about. So I'm, I'm basically happy with the calculation. I'm not ecstatic. It would be fun to have it be better, but it's pretty good. So now I got a code that's running, and I will look at the states of channel 181. The energy levels look like this. Um, so there's lots of states, and there's all this strange and intimidating notation. And the way it works is it's kind of interesting. There's the states here. These are called intrinsic states. So these are states which are different from one another. And all of the other states are basically rotated versions of these guys. They spin around. And that's how the low energy transitions work. The transition that I'm interested in is between the ground state, which is a 1G state, and the excited state, which is a 1H state. Um, I don't know why all these states are deformed. This one's not special. Uh, I think that's a typo. Um, anyway, um, so we can build up deformed, uh, rotated models if we like. Um, for example, if the ground state gets rotated, here's one with one unit of angular momentum extra, two units, three units, four units, and it keeps on going. In fact, I went to the NUDAT2 database and I pulled them all out and I plotted them against the kinetic energy and I get a beautiful, very nearly straight line. So I'm convinced that the states are actually rotated versions of the ground state. Um, this is for the first excited state. This is for the second excited state. And I was going to keep on going, but they ran out of identifications. The, the, the fourth one and its rotations haven't been identified uh, systematically at this point. Anyway, it works. We got lots of states, and they kind of make sense in a weird kind of nuclear physics kind of way. Um, the deformation parameters are available in the literature, but I thought it would be fun to go ahead and calculate it out to see if I could come to the same conclusion as people in the literature. So if I take the quadrupole deformation parameter and I scan it, what I'm trying to do is to get the ground state and the first excited state to cross. And they don't cross for reasonable values of parameters uh, for a simple quadrupole deformation model. Uh, so this is discouraging. So then I go and I read the papers, and the papers say, well, you have to include the next order deformation in order to get them to cross. So I include the next order deformation parameter with the literature value <clears throat> and run it again. And lo and behold, the ground state crosses with the first excited state with the quadruple parameter about 0.25. So I think, aha, I get a number. That number agrees with the literature, and we're happy. 
so then I thought, well, there's people measure the quadrupole moment, so does this deformation parameter have anything to do with the observed quadrupole moment? Yeah, so I look in the <clears throat> literature, and the best value is obtained from a measurement mnemonic tantalum, and that's the number for the quadrupole moment. And then I have a formula that I can use for my quadrupole deformation parameter. If I plug it in, I get a value of about 0.25. So I get consistency between the level crossing and the quadrupole shape of the nucleus. So I'm happy. Of course, other people were happy too. In fact, people were so ecstatic about this that they gave you know, Nelson, Agabor, and so forth a Nobel Prize for all of this. Uh, that's, that's what happiness can do with models. Okay, so now we have wave functions, we've got interaction, and we would like to try calculating the phonon nuclear interaction matrix element. So uh, the idea is um, if all that's going on is we take an interaction and boost it, well, the obvious interaction, the Nielsen model would be the spin orbit interaction. So what I've done is I've boosted the spin orbit interaction and I get a uh, basically a phonon, nucleon, uh, phonon nuclear coupling interaction that looks like this. Um, and I can check it against my non-relativistic version of the commutator and basically it gives me this, which is similar to the boosted version. And when all's said and done, I'm, I'm basically happy enough that I've got an interaction that I know what I'm doing with it so I can uh, calculate it. Um, so I got to calculate the proton orbitals. I check. So here's this one's the ground state orbital that I'm interested in. This is Dudex code. This is my couple channel code. Excited state Dudex code. My couple channel code. Not perfect, but close enough for government work or for this calculation. Um, so I go ahead. I I calculate the matrix element in the form of an A dot CP, with A being this. I plug it in, I calculate the matrix element, and the magnitude of the matrix element is this number here. And I look at this, and this is on the low side of what I've been estimating over the last five or six years or so, but it's sort of within the realm of what I would have expected, and I have a number. So this is my, my very first uh, phonon nuclear coupling matrix element for having nucleus. I previously couple, uh, calculated it for the DD going to helium-4 some of those transitions, <clears throat> and that's published. Um, in retrospect, that calculation needs to be redone, but to an error's factor of two or three, those numbers are probably is uh, going to give the similar answer to the current approach. Um, at Sendai, I talked about the possibility of a way to observe this coupling using homonuclear diatomic tantalum 2, so tantalum 181, tantalum 181 in a molecule. The idea is that if you excite one, if there's phonon nuclear coupling, then it'll get transferred over here and then transferred back and here, 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 which basically is equivalent to a level splitting. So the question is, is, is this observable? Now that I have a matrix element, should I tell my experimentalist friends to go off and do this experiment, knowing this is an extremely difficult and expensive and painstaking experiment to do? So I plug in the numbers, and the interaction looks like this. I plug in numbers, I get 6 times 10 minus 12 electron volts. And then I say to myself, it's pretty small. In fact, it's too small to see in a MOS power experiment. And I'm, and I'm starting to breathe easy for a moment that I didn't encourage all of my experimental friends to go off and measure this thing because there was no chance of seeing anything, which I now know because I have the coupling matrix element. So I have to use a different experiment in order to see this. Okay, let me think about radiative decay for a moment. Um, if I were doing atomic physics, I would calculate the radiative decay rate with my wave functions because that's how you tell what, how good your wave functions are. So for the nuclear thing, I plug in my wave functions and I get a decay rate of this number, um, nearly 4 times 10 to the 8th inverse seconds, which is pretty fast. This number is pretty close to what's called the Weisskopf estimate, which is sort of a generic estimate for dipole transitions for nuclei here. And so I'm basically in agreement, so I'm happy. Um, now, somebody has to go talk to the experimentalists because the number from experiment is off by five orders of magnitude. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, it's difficult sometimes for a theorist to interact with a nucleus because they, or with experimentalists, because the the theorists get a good proper number, which is the, they know which is the right answer, and the experimentalists measure something else. What do you do with experimentalists? Um, anyway, I, I'm not the first one to come across this problem. Uh, it turns out that this deviation, even for Tantalum 181, was well known uh, basically even in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and this problem is discussed extensively in the literature. It turns out Tantalum 181 isn't the only nucleus for which there's a problem. So here's the Weisskopf estimates for odd A nuclei with an even number of neutrons, odd number of protons. So these are transitions that are similar in all of the nuclei, which are similar. And Weisskopf estimate down here, experiment down here, blue line that corresponded to a theory that I had that might explain this, which I, before the conference, managed to prove was wrong. Um, so basically, there aren't any nuclei that have transitions with radiative decay rates in the low energy range that have much to do with what you would calculate or what Weisskopf would calculate uh, at all. So this is a generic problem. Um, so this, this has been known forever in Hans Bethe's 1937 review article on nuclear physics. He talks about this uh, and came up with a really cute uh, argument as to why uh, there might be a problem like this. Turns out the, the similar problem exists for magnetic dipole and electric quadrupole transitions. Um, for low energy intrinsic transitions, all of them have this uh, problem. Rotational transitions, you can calculate by theory and you get the right answer. It compares to experiment beautifully. So it's only internal transitions. It's not, it has to do with rotations of uh, nuclei. So Nielsen uh, the folks that won the Nobel Prize had a resolution in particular for Tantalum 181. They said, aha, we can explain this. There's um, an interference effect. So for the, the deformed nuclear wave functions they were working with, it just so happened with their parameters, they uh, found an interference effect. They got a very small number and they said, aha, success, it works. We understand why the rate's slow. And I thought, um, uh, great. In fact, I was motivated to do this calculation knowing about this problem because Nielsen said that there was an interference effect. So I figured, okay, so this is understood. So I thought, well, let's review this. Let's use our code and my code and calculate everything out. And uh, the optimum solution uh, using a, basically a much better model than what Nielsen had um, I can find the interference. Here's the interference. It just occurs with uh, quadrupole and, and oct uh, octopole parameters that are very far away from the optimum. So, so basically, this this accidental interference effect, which which Nielsen and others claimed occurs, it certainly occurs for their version of the model. But if we do a more modern version, we're far away from any interference. So, my argument is that. Nielsen's explanation is not robust. Uh, I don't think it works for Talon 181. I also don't think it, it's a systematic explanation for all the others as well. So I don't think there's any, I, I, I don't think the difference is due to interference. There's also a, a pairing effect, which is basically configuration interaction effect or pairing's part of it. And uh, you know, basically the argument is a factor of 25 for the radiative decay rate or five for the matrix element. Um, if I could get the matrix element for the phonon nuclear coupling to within a factor of five, at least today I would actually be happy. So I'm, I'm viewing the pairing as being uh, uh, small potatoes. On the other hand, I have not actually seen a modern calculation of the pairing for Talon 181, so I don't even know if it's a factor of five in the matrix element at this point. Okay, so what I would like I would like to have a model where I could calculate the phonon nuclear coupling matrix element, calculate the radiative decay, get the right answer in both cases, then I would have some confidence. But it's not going to happen with the Nielsen model or Hartree-Fock model or Thomas Ferryman models. 
Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion, so this is, we're now entering the realm of speculation. Uh, I'm of the opinion that what we're seeing is actually a simple screening effect. I, there's core nuclei, core nucleons, and if you have an applied electric field, the core nucleons should polarize. So I'm thinking that this would be the simplest way to explain all of the uh, discrepancies. Now the, the headache is, it's a very simple concept, but if you go ahead and you use Nilsson, Hartree, Fock, Thomas, Fermi, or all, all modern nuclear models, they don't give a screen, they give a couple of percent screening. And the reason for it is very simple, that if you displace, if you polarize and you displace some charge, uh, if the restoring force is columbic, then, and only columbic, then you can screen. But if there's a strong force contribution to the restoring force, then basically the strong force is much stronger than Coulomb. You don't get any screening at all. So the, the basic issue, the problem in these models, is that there's a strong force, uh, restoring force contribution, which kills off all screening. So the question is, is, are, is it possible to have a model that works differently? So the, the brainstorm, one, one morning I, I woke up in the middle of the night and said, aha, eureka or something. Of course, who knows if it's right or not. But the, the basic idea is that the current models that people use are basically quantum gas models, hartree fock model, and the others are quantum gas models. The electron basically can go where, or the nucleons can go freely wherever they want within the potential in these models. So having downloaded, oh, I don't know, hundreds of papers at this point, there's few models that take a position that maybe it's a quantum liquid or quantum solid at the fundamental level. I mean, all the papers say that they're quantum liquid, uh, uh, um, but there's no, there's nothing equivalent to hartree fock that, that will do a quantum liquid type model. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, can I, can I put one together that I can work with? So the basic idea is, well, why not? And this, the basic idea is to say that maybe the, so I'm, I'm starting from uh, crystal models, sort of what Cook was thinking, but Cook has fixed spin and isospin at all the sites, and there's an exchange interaction, so if there's exchange, then the spin and isospin will be mobile, which means charge mobility. But if you had, if you took this kind of structure, and you basically said the nucleon positions were fixed by the strong force, but you allowed for spin and isospin exchange, then you would have exactly the situation we were hoping for. You'd have mobile charge, but there'd be no restoring force due to the strong force uh, interaction. Uh, the way to implement this would basically be to use an R split with ST kind of model, so space is split from spin and isospin. You can separate basically very, very straightforwardly. And um, you know, it's, it's basically easy to specify a model that will work this way. As near as I can tell from the literature, this hasn't been studied, and I've, I've dug and looked at all the papers I can dig, but everybody that's even remotely interested in this. Um, anyway, uh, rigorous derivation is possible. The formulation is pretty simple. I looks like I, yeah, I, here's some notes for the central potential contribution. Basically, I'm able to r reduce uh, a nuclear model straightforwardly. Anyway, um, can already see features in the model. Uh, spin boson or spin and isospin exchange happens within the lattice. I can see that I'm going to get a simple derivation of modified Born and Nilsson type of deformed nuclear model, uh, except that this one will screen, and it's also going to have a little bit heavier uh, nucleon mass, which will make it much easier to agree with the um, ordering of the nuclear levels. Uh, anyway. Um, this kind of model, if it can be developed, and I, I don't know, hopefully, hoping this summer maybe I can make some progress on it, but uh, it would be it would be quite useful for lots of applications and not, not just cold fusion. Anyway, conclusions. Um, well, conclusions, well, we've got a phonon nu n nuclear coupling interaction, which I think can provide an engine for theories for CMNS. Uh, we've got some idea now how the coupling works. 
This is the first detailed calculation for transition having nucleus, and it's for the one which I think is the most important uh, transition. It's within the range of what is expected. Um, uh, it sets up, means we can calculate more, but the big issue for me is that because of the headaches associated with radiative decay, I'm not sure how much I should trust it. I mean, I, I'm not even sure that we can calculate transitions like this for heavy nuclei until the radiative decay problem is better understood or there's some resolution of it. Anyway, thank you for your attention.